Guitar playing is so much more than a career choice. It's a vehicle to do something that's outside of yourself. And my parents would get me VHS videos of, of my favorite bands playing live. And I was like just watching these and thinking, okay, how do these people do that? How, how do you get out in front of people and like not, you know, freak out? It took me kind of inching my way toward the front of the stage. So I ended up going from keyboard to guitar, <laughs> which was my gateway to guitar. Truly just because I wanted to be a badass and I wanted to be one of those people that was on stage unafraid. It's not only like your musical instrument, it's like, it's the instrument to, to get that, that feeling, that thing that gets you off about music. Try to connect the brain to the fingers, you know, the shorter the connection, the better. That's what I'm always striving for. I cite guitar playing and I cite this band with pushing me forward and uh, giving me that kind of north star. So yeah, it's a it's a feeling. It's a thing that you carry with you. It's a it's a fire. I grew up on Black Sabbath and Alice Cooper and Van Halen and I remember we moved to a 20 acre farm when I was 11 and some of the neighborhood girls were like we're having a sleepover but bring a bunch of your favorite CDs because we're all going to switch around and listen to each other's favorite songs. You can see where this is going. So I brought Love It to Death by Alice Cooper and uh, Holy Diver by Dio. And so you can imagine, so we're all sitting around and uh, listening to music at this sleepover. And, and this is around the time where there was TLC and Backstreet Boys and Spice Girls and all of that. And they're like, oh, let's put in Lizzie's CD. And so we put it in, I don't, think, I don't think we made it past the first chorus. They're like, put Tina's back on, you know? But I remember going back home and my dad being like, so how was it, you know? And, I had fun. I don't think they liked my music though. And he's like, well, that's good. I'm like, why is that good? Because you love your music because you love it, not because everyone else loves it. A couple years later, when I was 13, we started Hailstorm and that was the bed that I had. I didn't like rock music because my brother did. So <laughs> I would like, I wouldn't listen. He liked Nirvana, Metallica in like 91, 92. And we were listening to, was it 1021, the alternative station? The music on there just like, I got it. And it was like a light switch. It was like, this is awesome. You know, Nirvana was like my first band that like I had to figure out how to do that, that loud, quiet thing. And I remember I had a little practice amp. And I didn't have a pedal. So I'd like play the clean part and then, you know, push the <laughs> push the gain, try to hit it quick. And I remember getting whatever metal pedal, metal zone probably, I don't even know, some overdrive pedal that like blew my mind. I could have a clean tone and I was like, oh, this is it, man. When it clicks, it clicks, and then you're like, oh, wait, this is, this is totally possible, and, you know, here it is, you know. And you can call it determination, but I prefer obsession, I think, yeah. is more, <laughs> more apt. I think it's important for everyone to find that thing. Nowadays, I think that girls are more encouraged to do what they want to do and what they desire to do. I grew up in a household where, I mean, we didn't even really talk about the whole glass ceiling thing. It was just like, if you want to be a mechanic or a doctor or rock star, rodeo clown, you know, whatever, you know, gets you, you can totally do it. It's like three different lifetimes that I've lived as far as like the girldom. The beginning was total naivete and, and I have no idea that all this stuff is going, that there's like, oh, it's kind of a weird thing to be a girl in rock music, or I had no idea. That kind of almost blinders on mentality just meant I just kept moving forward and I didn't pay any attention to it. So you load in your equipment and people are like, oh, 
my girlfriend never carries my guitar for me, you know, that kind of stuff. And then I remember early on, we used to start out just, just with me, just me up on stage because no one's gonna expect just a girl to walk out on stage at a rock show. And then you get to this middle section where, you know, you're being shopped around to labels and there's a lot of, well, you know, we love what you do, but we can't do anything with you because women on rock radio, that's not really a thing. And so then you get this whole defiance that becomes your fire where it's like, well, that's ridiculous. I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so then you keep moving and then it's really great right now to be on this kind of third tier of that. Whereas you can be on stage and look at all of these girls and just see them just get it. Just you're, they're looking on stage like, oh, yes, absolutely, this is possible. Just remembering what it was like to be like, oh look, there's a North Star, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, you know, it's possible to do this. when you first starting to play guitar, you go to the music store and everything's so new and you're like, okay, what, what do these different gauges of picks mean and what do these different gauges of strings mean? And then you see Ernie Ball, it's something that you grow up with. There's nothing like fresh strings on a guitar and I like that low, thick, low end and we do uh, 10 to 52s. So lighter on top, heavier on the bottom. Those little millimeter differences, you know, once you've been doing it long enough, that's home. That's where it feels right, and 10 to 52 feels right. When we started using the Paradigm strings, I remember going, talking with my guitar tech, Noah. He's like, oh, dude, these are really cool. Look at the way they're wound up at the ball. He's like, it works good with the, the big, he's like, these are, he, I remember his like seal of approval. And I was like, all right, cool, we got, we got good strings. to chase whatever gets you excited. So whether that means that I started a song and I bring it to the guys, he has an idea, he brings it. To me, that's the initial moment that, that matters. It's what I put into my voice memo on the phone. Sometimes it comes quick and sometimes you fight for months wrestling this riff and this piece of music and what comes next. And It's keeping that, you know, that mission statement together. It's like, okay, this is what got us excited initially. You know, that's what we're going to chase after. And we've been more focused just in the past couple of years on making those moments because what we ended up incorporating into our live shows was this element of, of improv. So we have this musical language together. And when we, you know, get into a, a certain section where we don't really know how we're going to end it, <laughs> but we all have to listen to each other and make those moments together. So trying to capture that, um, those elements in a recording and in a new song and write songs for those moments have been something that we're, we've been obsessed with. One thing you learn is you never really run out of dreams. We won a Grammy. We've played music all around the world, and which was kind of the big idea when I was a kid. And but now I want to I want to do it more. But I want to do it better too. How do you write better songs? How do you play 
better. I'm still taking lessons. So much I haven't unlocked yet. I think you're always searching for something. You're always searching for something that's going to uh, reignite that fire that is, it never goes away, but sometimes you just need that like, oh, cool, that's something different. That's something new that I can go down this path and maybe incorporate it in the next record. It's the chase, I think, that I'm really, I get excited about.